could we have the all hallways cleared for fire reasons? We have to have the exits cleared. So if you just leave a pathway down the center, it'd be fine. to the poor people that are stuffed out there outside the doors. And some of you could come into the aisle. Make sure you leave an aisle open, but maybe some of you could sit along the edge or get some more people in so some of those poor people can at least get into the room. I'd appreciate it. But just try to keep a line open to the doors. But maybe you can you know, sit single file along the aisle there. There's room. There's room. <laughs> Are you moving in? <laughs> I'll wait. N not that he needs a formal introduction or anything, but... I don't know what I'm going to do. We thought it would be kind of neat if the uh, current head of engineering would introduce one of the future heads of engineering. <laughs> to carry on my job. Boy, well, what a cry, what a cry. Uh, this is the CFC pledge presentation. <laughs> Sign them up. Uh, Aldo was so gracious to let me introduce Scotty or Jim or whoever we want to call him uh, to Goddard. Uh, I'm so happy he was one of my heroes and one of my uh, heroes for my children throughout the years. But let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, his real name is Jim Duhan. Doing. Yeah, you're stealing everything out there, buddy. <laughs> doing, doing. Uh, and he was born in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, when I met Jim today for the first time at lunch, uh, there was about 15 or 20 of us sat around a table, and we were all introduced. And Jim showed me a real feat of memory. I mean, he we introduced ourselves, and Jim, right in the middle of lunch, says, "Well." How you doing, Tom, Jim, Phil, Karen, boom, 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 all the way around. And I said, how do you do that? And he says, well, you know, I just have a very good memory. So what I want to do is have each of you stand up. <laughs> and give me your name, and after the lecture, he'll repeat them all. <laughs> yeah, I'll never make it. Isn't that right, Jim, <laughs> and Phil, and Mary, and John, and Peter, right? <laughs> and Harry. And Harry's yes, out there, too. Yeah, Harry's yeah. out there. Uh, just quickly, uh, Jim uh, had an acting career early in his age, uh, 15 and early in his youth. Uh, he played Robin Hood in a school play. I'm sure Kevin Cosner could have taken some notes on that if he was I born at that time. Uh, he <laughs> That's for mispronouncing your name. Yeah. He continued, he continued acting and he won a scholarship at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York and he taught there for three years. Uh, he then, uh, after that, he went into the Canadian Army. No, no, no. The no, artillery. No. No? That's what they gave me. Well, they gave it to you wrong. <laughs> Where'd you go? <laughs> um, no, let me tell you. I played Robin Hood in high school, and I played Master of Ceremonies for, for two of the high school years at the uh, uh, skits uh, thing, where we uh, did a, uh, reviews and skits and all that sort of stuff. Never did any more acting after that, or even something that could be called acting. I was uh, always a good singer. I was a boy soprano and uh, everything else, and uh, I started too late in life, so my voice changed, and I couldn't, couldn't get up to uh, uh, the peaks. Uh, that were necessary to start this song. If anybody has ever heard Schubert's Hawk, Hawk the Lark, you'll know why, because it starts on a hell of a high note. And uh, anyway, um, anyway, so I got second place. Um, anyway, then uh, the war came for Canada. It was on September the 3rd in 1939, and I was the 11th person to, uh, he's written that, uh, I was uh, the 11th person to uh, sign up in my area. 
And uh, four or five months after that, uh, I was uh, sent early over to England to go to a signal school. By that time, I was a corporal. I had started as a private. And, uh, and in the artillery, we called the corporals bombardiers. Then I uh, became a lance sergeant. And uh, then I was sent to a British officer school. And then uh, I was an aide de camp to a general. And then I uh, got tired of that uh, because uh, I told him, I said, I'm not uh, doing anything here, you know. And uh, so I uh, said, uh, get me out to a, u uh, a unit. So he sent me to the 13th Field Regiment, and I whipped them into shape. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I landed on D-Day, number one off on my beach, at Juno Beach. And I, had, I was in charge of a, uh, an LCA, number, number five LCA, uh, of the Winnipeg Rifles. The other four contained infantry. I had specialists aboard, uh, people such as you. I had um, um, beach commandos. I had uh, engineers. I had beach signals people there. I had my own assistant officer at that time. And uh, I had to go in and survey in the gun positions, which and the guns were supposed to come in at 10 o'clock. Actually didn't arrive until, until 1 o'clock, and only half of them have arrived. Um, but, um, however, uh, that night I was wounded and a machine gun opened up on me and I was uh, sent back to hospital and I got out five weeks later out of a convalescent hospital and I saw a notice on the notice board uh, at the reinforcement depot and uh, it, it said ask artillery officers to volunteer for air observation. I said, whoops, they're going to teach me to fly, <laughs> you know, and that's what they did. and. Uh, that was the, the physically, to me, absolutely flying the greatest year of my life. And that includes even acting. <laughs> okay? There you are, Tom. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much. I, I just want to make a couple more comments. Uh, you know, you noticed in the uh, flyer that he was the, considered the craziest pilot in the Canadian Air Force. I asked him at lunch, I said, how did you get that title? He said, I don't know. I got that title. He says, but I used to take the airplane up and stall it out and drop it down and then come in for a landing as I weave through telephone poles to the ground. <laughs> so I think... You, you elaborate beautifully. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's the reason. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, you did work in 4, 000, over 4,000 radio shows up in Canada. Yes, I did. And you also made many TV appearances. Now, a lot of you might not know who recognize these names. I do. Uh, a little more senior. The Fugitive, The Virginian, Peyton Place, Marcus Bobby, MD, Gunsmoke, and my favorite, Hazel. <laughs> and then he finally got the major role as Scotty in Star Trek, and the rest is history. Just a couple personal things I want to say. I feel NASA owes Scotty and that group a tremendous credit uh, gratitude. It, it brought the challenge of space in our living rooms every week. And it was the right show at the right time, where space was just getting started and uh, Star Trek just continued the support and brought to people's attention the excitement of space. Uh, we also, uh, you know, we saw him in a movie, or at least I did, where he was uh, uh, making plexiglass tanks for a couple of humpback whales <laughs> to keep us in the future to save the civilization. It also, he was in one scene that I remember where uh, Cap Captain Kirk fired him on the radio. Uh, he said that he couldn't break this uh, beam that was uh, run by a computer named Val that was holding the spacecraft in space. And finally, old reliable Scotty got his laser beams out and shot that computer <laughs> dead. But it, was, it was that type of imagination and, and uh, that, uh, is a pioneer of space. And the last thing I have to say is I did read the, uh, the interview in the Smithsonian, uh, where we, uh, it was last week, I hope most of you read it, where they're taking the characters of Star Trek and uh, putting in the Smithsonian. It's the first time that I know that uh, fictional characters would be displayed in the museum. And I hardly endorse it, because uh, he is as part of space as anybody in this room or the pioneers before us. So, I mean, uh, 
Star Trek is, is my favorite and always will be in the characters in it. So without further ado, I would like to introduce and welcome to Goddard, the Chief Engineer of Space, Mr. James Scotty Duhu. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. you. You have absolutely no idea how coming to a place like uh, the Goddard Space Center, uh, what it means to me, because uh, I'm behind you 100% all the way, no matter what you do. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just uh, it's something that uh, I think I, I, I have in my bones, ever since I read Buck Rogers in the Detroit Times, which used to be our Sunday paper in Sarnia, Ontario, and um, it, was, it was just fabulous to me to think about it, and uh, whether it was uh, Buck Rogers or whatever, I don't know, but uh, I became highly proficient in uh, mathematics chemistry, physics, and uh, just about never fail to get 100% in those subjects. I let most of the other subjects, literature, etc., cetera, um, <laughs> fall by the wayside. But uh, to me, somehow I, I seem to be able to do things for uh, uh, certain branches of uh, the uh, armed forces and certain uh, people, and uh, I get to the rewarded by coming to a place like this. And uh, it certainly is a reward for me. I have been to Lewis in Cleveland a couple of times. I've been to the China Lake. I've been to many other, I've been to Hughes. Um, uh, all sorts of experimental labs uh, that I have been to, it, and, and it thrills me. I have also uh, uh, had an eight hour cruise on a nuclear submarine. I've been aboard three aircraft carriers, landing out on them in the, in the ocean. They fly me out, and uh, it's just fabulous, you know, to me. Uh, I, I, I can't think of anything that satisfies me more than that. However, uh, there are, to me, just a few uh, little serious things that I want to talk about, such as uh, when we harness the um, matter-antimatter, Which, of course, uh, if, when we get to uh, uh, fusion with it, that'll make the hydrogen fusion look like a candle. And, uh, but you know what? We will get there. I know we will. And we have to get there. Because we only have a billion years left in this Earth, and we've got to get out of here somehow. <laughs> and uh, let me tell you, is that uh, I don't want... I would not like to see, I have no idea what is uh, in the plans, but uh, I would never like to see us have years and years of satellite training without manned spacecraft. To me, I think manned spacecraft uh, we have to do because it would be like uh, the, shall we say, the city of Los Angeles that allowed all their interurban trains to go, which is General Motors' fault in the first place. <laughs> and uh, because, no, they bought up and let, then they let them run down so that they could build buses and, and uh, um, you know, hey, we're managed by some of these big corporations and, uh, and that's not good. Uh, so consequently, Los Angeles, very late in life, has to build subway trains and fast ur urban trains now. They had them before. You take the city of Toronto. They never let go of anything. They just keep on improving everything they have. They sell their 55 mile an hour streetcars to uh, cities like Pittsburgh and San Francisco and they buy 70 mile an hour ones. And, uh, and when I tell you that who, wh who wants a 70 mile an hour streetcar? You wait till you're stuck on a, a Toronto street at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's when they do 70 miles an hour. And it's absolutely amazing. They have subways. 
They have electrical buses, they have buses. They have go trains, they have uh, just about everything you can possibly imagine that Los Angeles let go. And if we ever let go of manned spacecraft, we're going to be in the same problem maybe 50 years from now or 100 years from now. To me, I think it's vitally important, and that's the only serious thing I really have to say. Okay, now, the next problem. The next problem is uh, I usually find that uh, parents push their children to ask the questions when it comes to a question and answer period. And uh, the reason is that I think the parents are shy and they don't really know how to ask questions. So what, uh, what I will do will be to train you how to ask questions and then, you know, let's sort of bring you into it gently so that uh, you won't feel uncomfortable. You understand? I hope you do. Uh, so what I will do is uh, will, I will pose a question, then I'll answer it. You'll find out how easy it is. Okay? So we take the, the case of the person who has the diagrams of the enterprise, and they check them out, and they get the magnifying glass also, and they say, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. no, no toilets. <laughs> You must understand, of course, that we do have phasers. <laughs> Need I say more? All right. The next question. I think you can all hear me, can you not? Sure. Raise your hand in the back if you can't hear me. <laughs> and I'll go back to this. I hate these things. But anyway, this is a darn good one, by the way. I know it is. You can hear me now? Yeah, somebody's going like this. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, a lot of people also ask the question, is, what would I do if I were captain? The, <laughs> the very first thing I would do would be to limit Ensign Kirk. <laughs> to one girl every five years. I mean, that used to get boring, you know. <laughs> Except, well, of course, when I would get a girl. And then it all mean, depends on what you mean by get, you know. Um, Chekhov would never be allowed to scream again. <laughs> he got too good at it. As a matter of fact, when we, when we read Star Trek VI for the first time, we all let out a cheer at the end because there never was a line in there saying, Chekhov screams. <laughs> Right? Oh, good. Sulu would never be allowed to carry arms. <laughs> you see the finished product, right? And it all looks as if it was so easy. 30 takes. <laughs> oh, George is just one of these people that if you went hunting with him, you're walking along beside him, you'd find his shotgun right here. All <laughs> Now, he knows I tell this story on him, and he, he gets a good laugh. And if you've never heard George laugh, it's something else. It's just, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Marvin. The next thing, we would hire a couple of writers. <laughs> to give Uhura some other lines other than hailing frequencies open to her. Because she's so pretty, she's so good, she sings beautifully, and besides that, she loves me. <laughs> so, uh, then the Bones would never be allowed to say, he's dead, Jim. Because <laughs> basically, he doesn't really know what he's talking about, you know. I mean, all he has to do is bring out his little salt and pepper shaker and, you know. And uh, all of a sudden you're alive and you look up and say, well, what's going on here? You know, that's about it. And finally, Mr. Spock would never, ever, ever, ever be allowed in my engine room. <laughs> Way back in the old days, when uh, this engineer who built the ship, who knows how everything works, 
and you know did everything knows, knows what every computer will do and everything else we would run into trouble they'd send Mr. Spock down to the engine room <laughs> and there would be Scotty off in the corner saying oh gee Mr. Spock <laughs> you're so marvelous all I had to do is just watch you and one of these days they'll call me a miracle worker <laughs> the next question that a lot of people ask is how did I get the role of Scotty well to cut a long story short my agent sent me to read for the part of a Scotland Yard inspector to on Burke's Law everybody a lot of people seen Burke's Law right with Gene Barry in the lead and uh, so I did about three British accents for them and at the end they said well you know uh, you know you you you're, uh, you you just look like Gene's younger brother I said I'm much better looking than he is <laughs> you know? and uh, anyway I didn't get that job but about ten days later <clears throat> the director of that called me and said uh, and his name was Jim Goldstone he said, uh, Jimmy, he said, I'd like you to come and do some of your accents for these Star Trek people. I said, who are they? <laughs> so he told me. I went down. I said, fine. So I went down there on a Saturday morning, which is unusual because they wanted to start shooting on Tuesday. <laughs> <coughs> and um, so I went down there and they handed me a page of uh, the script uh, with some words on it, uh, nothing to do with engineering or anything else. And... Uh, I proceeded to do seven or eight different accents for them and uh, at the end Gene Roddenberry said to me well he said uh, which accent do you like and I said well I said if he's going to be an engineer I think he better be a Scotsman <laughs> because in my uh, in my history at that time Scotsmen were great engineers you know and um, so he said well we rather like that one too I said fine well I jumped right in I said I'll call him Montgomery Scott after my maternal grandfather and so on and so on and I went on with a few other things and, and Gene said no 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 what 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 whoo hold everything <clears throat> Gene's one of these guys of course that doesn't like the wind taken out of his sails you know and not only that I haven't signed a contract or anything else however um, supposing though that instead of a Scotsman they had picked some other dialect and when Captain Kirk calls down to uh, engineering and says, give me warp 12, instead of hearing the familiar, warp 12, Captain, my engines just can't take that. <laughs> instead of that, you hear, C. <laughs> or you hear, oi vey, what is this warp 12 <laughs> I can give you a three fours. <clears throat> I can give you four threes. I can get eleven for your wholesale. You know about that, are oh, you cheap old? <clears throat> oh, we have um, whatever you say, sweetie. Oh, we have. Now listen here, Captain. I'll tell you many times before. I don't like to go above that warp height. <laughs> Oh, that's an order. Well, all right. Well, we have, ha ha, you be young Kirk, eh? Well, sir, I'll see you hanging from the highest yard arm in Starfleet before I'll give you a warp 12. <laughs> oh, we have, ha <laughs> ha, Captain. You are playing with me, huh? <laughs> and also, I noticed that on the last planet, you did not get the girl. You should have come to Lucky Pierre. <laughs> My favorite, though, would, would, would have been rather lots of fun. And uh, I have a name for him. He, we call him Reggie. And he would answer the captain something like this. I'm terribly sorry, sir, but I can't seem to get the little buggers to move any faster. <laughs> oh, you see? I thought you all did quite well, you know. So I, if you have a little nerve now, you can ask a question. All right? <laughs> yes, sir.
Is there any possibility of me appearing on the next generation? No, I do not want to look that old. <laughs> You saw what they did to DeForest Kelly. There wasn't one, one centimeter, one square centimeter of his face that didn't have a wrinkle in it. You know? Oh, that's terrible. You have to sit in the chair for about four hours, you know? And I don't want to earn money just by sitting in a chair. Actually, uh, you know, there'll probably be some way they'll, they'll, they'll get me in eventually. I don't know. Uh, uh, I know uh, some people are, are writing scripts about that, but uh, they just like the way I act. That's all. <laughs> Okay? Yes, ma'am. What's your favorite episode? What do I think of what? What was your favorite My favorite episode? episode? Actually, uh, it's a very fine line, you know, um, but I like the one, <laughs> everybody here should like this answer, uh, I like the one that is in more scientific terms, which was the one called the Doomsday Machine. And because uh, that's the way I like it to be. Because to me, science fiction, should, that you should underline the word science 50 times and then say the words fiction at the end. But, you know, uh, Dean Roddenberry used to say to me, you know, Jimmy, this is science fiction. He says, fantasy must be in there too, you know. <laughs> I said, well, I said, I don't like it. <laughs> well, <clears throat> he says, you still want the job? <laughs> <clears throat> yes. See, I told you. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, to tell you the honest truth, well, I really don't know. Usually we have to give Paramount about a year and a half to think about it. You know, they put 75 or 80 or 100 million dollars into the bank and then they start thinking, well, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, they just, uh, they sit there and they sit there and they sit there. You know, it, it's unbelievable how long they sit. I mean, the way we should have, uh, we just finished number six and, and it's out we should have been doing at least number 10 <laughs> well, instead of 6, right? But that's the, you know. Okay. Yes? Any more questions? Yes, sir. What kinds of scientific and technical advice went into the making of an episode? What kind of scientific effects? Oh, what kind of a, a, a technical advice would go into making a show like that? Actually, uh, to start it all off, Gene Roddenberry went to the Rand Corporation in Santa Monica, which is the big uh, think tank out there, and uh, he asked them what was possible and probable, and, uh, and they told him. And that's where uh, Matter and Matter came in, and uh, you know, and, uh, all sorts of other things, lasers. Uh, by that time, we, we, you would have maybe a different name for them and you call them phasers, and, uh, but the only thing uh, that uh, they didn't have, and probably the only thing that will never happen, was to be the fact that, uh, of the transporter, because of breaking the human body down into uh, you know, powder and sending it some place, you know, it's a, in a way, a little ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I mean, uh, Roddenberry wanted a fast way to to get uh, from the ship to the planet and the planet back to the ship again. So uh, that was that, you know, and it was uh, terribly simple to do. <coughs> uh, but you know, it's absolutely amazing the number of people who say, well, how does the transporter work? <laughs> so anyway, yes? Any more questions? Yes? One, two, or three. About how long did it take to film one episode for television? Uh, if we did it in six days, we were in budget. <laughs> we did that once. <laughs> uh, the next question. My fiance loves the Star Trek books on cassette. Have you done any? And if you have, do you plan on doing any? Excuse me, done. Yeah. And stuff like that. I was wondering if you have read for any of those, and if you have, do you plan on doing 
I, uh, I do an awful lot of uh, reading of novels for Simon & Schuster, all science fiction novels. And uh, they're, they're under the Star Trek aegis. But, uh, I mean, I did the last one, I, just, I, I, I did Star Trek VI, and then the last one I did uh, just about a, uh, five or six weeks ago was Probe. You know, if you ever read that book called Probe, Probe was uh, the uh, satellite or spaceship <coughs> in um, Star Trek IV that came and, uh, you know, nearly wrecked our planet. <laughs> you know, but uh, we got rid of them somehow. <laughs> okay? All right. And the next one. Do you have plans to do something else, or are you going to stay with Star Trek from now on? Ah. <laughs> Do I have plans to do something else, or am I going to stay with Star Trek from now on? To tell you the truth, uh, no, dear, I am, uh, if Star Trek is still going to do more, I will do those, but I'm really making a, a concentrated effort to uh, do characters far away from uh, doing one with an accent, or certainly one with a Scottish accent. Uh, because I have been typecast, and it is absolutely deadly. There's no way that it isn't deadly. And that happened to me uh, seriously uh, by the, uh, 1971. I was telling uh, the people at uh, lunch today that I, uh, I, did, I was called up on uh, January of 1971 by a director that I had worked for where I did an English accent. And um, he called me and said, Jimmy, can you do a French-Canadian accent? And I said, yes. He said, okay, he says, uh, let your beard grow and be over here in five days. And it was a movie with uh, Richard Harris called Man in the Wilderness, and a very good movie it was, too. And, uh, but when I came back from that, I, had, I was over there for five and a half months. I had a, an apartment in Madrid, and we also went, to, we shot most of it just outside Madrid. And then uh, we went to uh, Segovia, and we went to uh, Soria up in the north. Um, and we had 10 days off because there was so much snow and we couldn't handle all that snow, they said. So um, I took off and went to London. <laughs> uh, but anyway, when I got back, I would walk into a producer's offices hoping to get a chance to read for a part. And the secretary would say, which she never, they never did before, said, oh, hi, Scotty. <laughs> you know. And, uh, and the producer would say, well, Mr. Scott. Yeah, <laughs> that sort of thing, you know, and, uh, and, and I'd say, well, are you going to give him, give him a chance to read here? Well, <laughs> no, no, well, no, you're awfully nice, but uh, thanks very much, no, and, uh, you know. Hey, listen, for the next five years, I didn't work in the business at all, and that is deadly. I don't know when any one of you don't work in the business, uh, your business uh, at all, that also is deadly, and uh, I would not never like to see it because it's, uh, it's terrible. Fortunately, around that time, the Program Corporation of America hired me, uh, or uh, sent me a letter and said, uh, you know, we are getting a lot of requests for you uh, from universities and colleges and so on, and would you like to sign up with us and, uh, and we take 30%. <laughs> so uh, I said, uh, well, uh, thanks very much, because that uh, was 70% I wasn't getting. <laughs> So I did a lot of that. I also did uh, a couple of plays, and one of which ran for 11 months, and, uh, and an another one ran for three months. And um, so, you know, I certainly existed anyway. But uh, the Program Corporation, it was in 1977, I did uh, 42 universities. That's not bad. The IRR IRS said that was a good year. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Uh, how does the transporter work? How? <laughs> the, the, the transporter, it worked like this. <laughs> I do have a serious question, and it, it has to do with politics. To build all these wonderful things, we need money, and the money is uh, managed by the politicians. How can we get them to understand the things that I think people around here understand? about the importance of this, of space? Well, I tell you, uh, I have been told, because of, of, of the uh, 
Um, you know, I did a, uh, uh, I um, narrated a, 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 a shuttle movie that was made, which is not really seen in this country, but uh, I did it for NASA, and, uh, and I charged them, uh, instead of $5,000, I charged them 500 which was the basic minimum which I had to charge, right? And uh, my agent didn't even get 10%. So uh, anyway, um, but I have, uh, by showing it to all these universities, I've been told that I am probably the, uh, the, the uh, most prolific private uh, pusher of NASA in the whole world. And I, I push it every chance I get. Uh, but the, uh, the thing about the transporter is that uh, this country certainly needs uh, to be told, because to me, I would love to see NASA's budget doubled. Because at least it needs to be doubled, for sure. Because uh, we, we cannot put ourselves in the position of uh, falling back and not keep everything going. It's the same as the city of Los Angeles, you know? You just can't do that. You can't afford to do it. Because to get back there again, that's tough. Really tough. And an awful lot more expensive. Okay? All right. Yes, dear? You know, and we, that's why we do our best not to have them, okay? <laughs> Over here and then here. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I uh, read somewhere, I think it might have been a TV guide, that they might be planning another Star Trek spin-off of some sort. You know anything about that? As a matter of fact, Paramount uh, shortly, uh, about five, four or five weeks ago, announced that they were going to do another uh, Star Trek show which would be based on a planet. I mean, uh, based on a, uh, a space base, a, a space platform of some sort, right? And uh, hopefully uh, uh, that will uh, keep on and promoting uh, space because, uh, you know, uh, certainly the effect that uh, we, we had, I think, uh, is, a, is a true effect. And uh, I know very well, as, uh, as I said when, when I was in Washington at the Space Museum there, I said uh, there is not a week that goes by that uh, someone doesn't say thank you because uh, you know you are the reason that I uh, became an engineer. And uh, it's absolutely and the same happened with McCoy with medicine and uh, with nurse uh, Chapel. Okay, yes, dear. <laughs> Which alien race would I like to see out there that's out there? Well, to tell you the honest truth, dear, uh, so far, I, I, I really do not believe in UFOs. Huh? Excuse me, I got it wrong somehow. <laughs> Oh, which episode of Star Trek uh, would, uh, if there was an alien race out there, that uh, what would I want them to see if they if they caught a, a, a one of the episodes of Star Trek, right? Ha, huh. ha. 
Very difficult, very difficult question. Uh, 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 probably uh, 15 or 20 of them actually that are, would, would serve the purpose. Um, I don't think we should uh, want them to see the trouble with tribbles. <laughs> I don't think we should have them, uh, maybe a city on the edge of forever or uh, possibly uh, the doomsday machine which is my favorite, you know. Um, what I, I also think number six movie would be a very good one because there there's a tremendous uh, uh, effort for peace throughout the universe in, uh, in Star Trek six, right? So I think that's a real good one, okay? Yes, sir. How does one get to be a writer for Star Trek? <laughs> How does one get to be a writer for Star Trek? Uh, to tell you the honest truth, I think you just have to sit down and write and put your ideas on paper. Uh, a lot of people ask me if I'm a writer. I said no. I said when I, I was, when I for, first did the, uh, after the war, when I first went to uh, Toronto to that uh, school where I eventually won a scholarship, to the neighborhood playhouse, um, and that was in January of 1946. I said, well, I better start learning to write. So I sat down and I wrote the word the, <laughs> and that just didn't even look right. <laughs> and I've been a failure ever since. Today, I, I really uh, dislike writing in all shapes and forms except autographing. <laughs> and I'm good at that. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, my, uh, when I'm, uh, I, I have to have something to do all the time. You know, I, I mean, I got a million things to do. I used to do a lot of uh, wood carving, but I lost my, uh, when I moved into the present house, I lost my, uh, my, all my woodworking tools and everything else. And, and um, so I'm going to have to do that again. Uh, in the new house up in Washington State. So uh, we're going to be building up there. And um, I was a pretty good carver and, you know, and I li like working with wood. As a matter of fact, uh, Gene Roddenberry's library in uh, the, s the l second last house that he had was all my work. And I just said, hey, you pay for the materials, I'll do it. I just have to be busy, you know. And sometimes, when I have nothing else to do, my wife will say, oh, why don't you just go and autograph your pictures? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's what I do. <laughs> yes, dear. Ah, uh, well, uh, let me tell you, I read a role about uh, three months ago. Uh, the, the question was, what sort of, sort of role would I like to play uh, if, uh, if I want to get away from doing Star Trek roles. Um, I read a role about three months ago, and about three and a half weeks ago, I did the role, and it was of a, uh, a deranged, retired chief of police. <laughs> and all I could think of was, oh boy, I'm going to eat that one up. <laughs> and I did. And... Uh, and I did it for a low-budget film, they had to pay my fee, but uh, the, uh, I did it for low-budget people, and uh, I knocked their pants off. And I know, because I know that I am one heck of an actor. <laughs> you know? And, that, uh, and that, is not, uh, that is nothing to do with false modesty. Because, uh, you know, I, uh, or even, uh, you know, overdone uh, modesty or whatever, um, I know the work that I have done long before I ever uh, did Star Trek. And I ache, really ache, to do that work again. And uh, I have another part from the same people. They just sent me a, a, about a, a week ago or ten days ago. They sent me another script, and I like that part too. 
And, uh, and it's, uh, I'm also, I can do any accent in the world. You know, so it's, it's not a question of accent. Um, it's just such a, a gorgeously powerful thing to do a character that uh, when, when you say a certain sound, just a sound, that's all you need. At certain moments, in a certain play, when what, it was, what has been built up, you can say, oh. And before you know it, the audience is either laughing or crying. And you did it. Marvelous feeling. And I'm telling you, I've seen the handkerchiefs come out. <laughs> a lot of males, too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, dear. How, how did you develop your different accents? How did I develop my different accents? God gave them to me, dear. And he gave me the ear, which can hear the music. And uh, I, just, uh, I, can, uh, I just happen to be able to hear not only what people say, but what sounds they don't make, which are very important. It's like a, a, a lot of uh, um, dialects, they leave off like a cockney. You say, that's all right. And you think you've heard the all right. You think you've heard the T on the end, but you haven't. I hear that he doesn't say it. And that is also fun. But I've been able to do it ever since I can remember, five or six years of age. My mother uh, told me that she says that when I started reading, I would read out loud and walk from the living room to the hallway, to the kitchen, to the dining room, to the living room, to the hallway, you know. And, then, and she said, every time you go through a door, you change your accent. <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, that was just, uh, and uh, God forbid that I would ever have become an actor, you know. But I, I, I must have been out of my mind to become an actor. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, to tell you the honest truth, I invented the Klingon language. <laughs> I did. That was in Star Trek One. Okay, then that's in enough. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the Simon and Schuster, they haven't sent me the tape yet. Uh, Simon and Schuster, at the end, when I finished reading Star Trek VI for them, they, uh, they said to me, would you, uh, would you create a different language than uh, the Klingons? And, um, and I said, sure. You understand? <laughs> yes, dear. How is the shimmering and the fading effect on the transporters done? You shoot it first, right? They run the camera for about 30 seconds. You stand there, <laughs> right? Then you get away from there and they run the camera with nothing there. Then they edit that with you there. They want to put you in or they want to gradually take you out. You're, you're, you're like one in 10 when you start to appear and then you're eight in ten, six in ten, and so on, until you gradually appear. You got it? Okay, and the same thing is done in reverse when, they, uh, when you want to disappear. And then they, uh, they this is the old-fashioned method. Then they, um, they would send you uh, the film to the optical company, and the optical company would put the shimmering in there and, and the, uh, the, the, the sparkle. Now it's all done by computers. Piece of cake. Right. Yes, sir. Tom. Oh, what a memory. <laughs> if, if you could, uh, could have worked for NASA, would you have been an engineer? And if so, what type of engineer? I more than likely, uh, if I had uh, worked for NASA, I would probably uh, more than likely have been a chemist of some sort. You know? Uh, 
Uh, that's about it. My father was a, 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 a great chemist. You know, he was a terrific man. As a matter of fact, the first man to invent high-octane gasoline. Tiny little refinery in British Columbia. 1923. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And then, then you. What do you think about the space station? I have uh, seen the space station uh, at, at, down in Houston. And, uh, and what do I think about it? I think it's absolutely necessary that we have it and we have to have people who can stay up there and do these experiments, you know, for two or three months or six months or whatever, I don't know, you know, it depends. Uh, we have to find out how long the human being can last. But then again, we also will find human beings who will automatically adjust to all these things. And uh, not everybody would probably be good in space. I'm going to give you a Scottish toast and then I'm going to translate it and you're going to have a tough job. <laughs> I'll say it twice and then I'll translate it. Here's Taeus and was like a sky few and there are deed. Here's Taeus and was like a sky few and there are deed. Nobody could possibly be as good as we are. To be that good, they'd have to be dead. Thank you. <laughs>